hi guys hope you have done well in your exam um honest truth is i don't want to really confuse you much today with medicine questions because like even we are not like quite sure about the options thank you so much guys thank you so much and hope you all have done your exams well and i have a couple of i mean in fact like 15 20 questions i have collected but the issue here is the options again uh i don't know like discussing the options right now is going to be the best deal or what because it's not even like 5 6 hours since the exam got over and it's going to be quite confusing so that's why i thought like probably i can just discuss some of the questions with you and get the options alone to some extent okay i think you are able to see the screen so one of the questions were on corn syndrome that was a quite easy question i believe so they asked like which of the following is incorrect so i think that is supposed to be your uh, hypernatremia a similar question we have discussed in our ends also is it right there was a question on corn syndrome a hyperaldosteronism question which is primary and the false answer was hypernatremia so because you see hyponatremia you see alkalosis so not hyponatremia you see like uh, I I don't know what was the option in that. So it was related to either hyponatremia or hypernatremia. So there was something like that. Okay. So that one was the question, and there was a question on tall PVV. Yes. So that's an easy one. So you're going to see in tricuspid stenosis. because tall p wave is a sign of right atrial enlargement hypokalemia alkalosis hypernatremia and hypertension okay so what you're not going to see is hypernatremia correct yeah so that was the right answer hypernatremia is not a finding in constant usually we don't see that so otherwise we do see hypertension we do see alkalosis and we do see hypokalemia okay you want to increase the font size all right no problem so i'm increasing to 20 20 okay all right so there was a question on hagma so what are the things that are seen so what are these multiple correct options i mean multiple correct answers i think so you do see hagma in patients with dk you do see hagma in patients with uh, starvation but i don't think uh, you're going to see hagma in patients with uh, vomiting vomiting is incorrect so vomiting is going to produce alkalosis right vomiting is going to produce alkalosis not acidosis so i think the answer for this is these two are right answers dk and starvation right so let me check is there any other question that we have got just hold on and i think was was there a question on cushing syndrome was there a question on cushing syndrome by the way i don't know like people said like there was a question on cushing syndrome so like corn syndrome i'm not sure about that all right so what is the site of leptin resistance there was a question we discussed that in endocrine so under obesity i have shown a diagram also that was a site of leptin resistance is basically the arcuate nucleus right arcuate nucleus so where you have the leptin receptors leptin receptors these receptors also called as the obrb receptors those are the leptin receptors i think the leptin receptors were there in the arcuate nucleus so usually the site of leptin resistance is supposed to be the arcuate nucleus so that's right answer for this question all right and apart from that there was a question on high output cardiac failure i think uh, there was a different mechanism they asked about heart failure so whether it is anemia fever sepsis or maybe thyrotoxicosis all these have similar mechanisms that is high output cardiac failure high output heart failure but not due to salt intake high salt is going to result in volume overload state 
volume overload. So this is the one thing that's the odd man out. So that's not the mechanism for heart failure, right? So all of them, anemia, fever, as well as thyrotoxicosis, all of them have a common mechanism. So high salt diet is the odd man out. Okay. And you want to ask about uh, Cushing syndrome. I don't know what question was on Cushing syndrome. People are telling there are two questions. So can you elaborate the options because I couldn't get the options in the group. So what are the options? So there were with regards to... Low DEXA, high DEXA, ACTH or high DEXA option. I don't know what you mean. I don't know. So what question was that? And a child with asthma and immunization steroid drugs with cushions. Okay. I'm not sure like the question as well as the options. We have been seeing the group, but I don't know. So I couldn't get any options like this. Low dose dexa, then high dose dexa. Give steroids and then check cortisol. Patient on SLE, taking steroid develops pushings. Okay, all right. So, what's the actual question on that? Patient with SLE taking steroids develops Cushingoid features. What's the question? Okay, adult on steroids, test to do Cushing. Check cortisol and then ACTH stimulation. I have to get the exact question right because this looks this looks like a little complicated. Next step to evaluate. Okay, it's okay. So we'll discuss that later on. So I'm not very sure about that question. I've asked so many times, but nobody replied to that. I'll ask in the group again. Hmm. Map is related, not able to recall completely. I'll just make a note of it. Okay, all right. So there was something with regards to NSIP, I think. They have given HRCT and the X-ray picture. So probably NSIP. They asked which is correct or which is incorrect. That itself is like confused among most of the students because most of the students are discussing most of the physiology and pharmacology questions in the group, but uh, they were not able to recall most of the medicine questions. I understand because most of the medicine questions are close options and it's not that easy to deal with because it's clinical questions also. So I don't know. So there was a question on NSIP. NSIP. That's what they said. They asked which is correct or which is incorrect. I don't know. You have to say. Absolutely. So it was related to rheumatoid arthritis. They say there was an option of fibrosis and honeycombing and off the questions, one of the options. See, I'm not asking the fact that UAP has honeycombing here. I'm just asking the fact that what was the exact question? I don't know, unless until you say that it's, it's really difficult. Okay, leave it. So, botanier deformity was another question. I think Apusa said that. There was an image that showed the uh, hyperextension of the DIP and hyperflexion of the PIP joint. So, that's basically the botanier deformity. All right. Yeah, unless until you tell the exact options and the exact image given, so it's really difficult to find out. First of all, students are quite confused between whether it's correct or incorrect. I don't know. So let us go on to the easy ones. I think they have given something about invasive pulmonary aspergillosis. Invasive pulmonary aspergillosis. The important risk factor is going to be neutropenia, febrile neutropenia. So this is the maximum risk. This has the maximum risk. This is the most important risk factor. All right. That's one. And apart from that, there was a question on Tigaro classification, easy one, chronic pancreatitis. We have discussed that so many times in our GTs as well. 
and uh, they have asked about the question on most common sites for aneurysm, like the berry aneurysm in the circle of Willis. It is basically the anterior cerebral artery. So to be exact, it's going to be at the communication of the anterior cerebral artery with the anterior communicating artery. Okay. Okay, leave the Cushing question. We have to discuss that one more time. So, do you think in Cushing syndrome you're going to see hypernatremia? Not really. Sorry, in Conn syndrome. No, not really. So, why they want is persistently telling that in Conn syndrome it was wrong, Conn syndrome it was wrong. So, you don't see hypernatremia in Conn syndrome, no? Sodium absorption is increased, but you don't see practically hypernatremia because of various reasons that we have discussed in the classes. You see hypertension, you see alkalosis, you see hypokalemia. Typical features, not hypernatremia. So, that's not a common feature of Conn's. CD4 count cannot be the answer because the highest risk is febrile neutropenia. We have discussed that so many times in our classes. I don't think there should be any confusion in that. So in HIV patients, even with the CD4 of less than 50, we don't see invasive pulmonary aspergillosis more common. It's very commonly seen in patients who are on chemotherapy and having neutropenia or probably patients who had a kidney transplantation or lung transplantation, especially lung transplantation. Post-transplant, it's very common. Or post-hematopoietic stem cell transplant, it's very common. But I don't think it's going to be common in HIV patients because of, again, various reasons. So, cardiomyopathy with banana-shaped ventricle. Okay, you got an HOCM image. All right. So, I'm not sure about that. So, nobody told about that. Okay. So, let me discuss. And uh, there was a question on congenital heart disease. No? So that was actually a PDA, that is persistent ductus arteriosus, where the patient had a murmur beneath the left clavicle, under the left clavicle, that's the Gibson's area, with a bounding pulse. With a bounding pulse. Right? Okay, there was a question on Jogren syndrome also. They asked about the next step. That's what I heard. So patients had Sika features like dry mouth, dry eyes. So they asked about the next step. Next step is serology, right? So you have to do serology, practically speaking. Shimmer test is fine. But honestly speaking, you have to confirm whether it's a primary Jogren or secondary Jogren. So if it's a primary Jogren, you're going to have anti roll up positive. If it's secondary Jogren, you can have other antibodies positive like uh, your rheumatoid factor or something like that. So serology will be the next ideal test to find out what's going on. Scintillographia. Okay, fine. So who, who's going to do scintigraphy? Or who's going to do shirmer straight away if you're thinking about Jogren syndrome, first of all? You have to find out the serology, no? So serology data is the most important. Ideally, that's going to be the next important step. So answer is shirmer plus antibody. So if that is the case, then it's very good. So that's going to be the right answer. But I thought it's going to be between Shirmer versus serology. So if it's both, then 100% yes, that's going to be the right answer. So why you want to do, I mean, practically speaking, you want to really do scintigraphy in a Jogren syndrome case? Who does that? Honestly, in practice, pick up someone who does that. So patient had a continuous moment, then the answer is even more simple. It's going to be a PD, easy one. Okay, antibody test plus shimmer. Okay, perfect. So then that must be the perfect choice. Right answer. Great. Thank you. Thank you for correcting. So was there a question on type 1 RTA? Was there a question on type 1 RTA? Okay, so there was a question on uh, iris, I guess. It's a TB iris. Patient who took ATT and ART together. Yeah, I got a question like that. 
Yeah. So HIV patient with TB, how will you manage him? You're going to start ART two weeks after ATT. Yeah. So HIV plus TB together in a, 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 ART naive patient, you're going to start ART two weeks later. Post ATT, yeah. So there was a question on type 2 respiratory failure. I'm not sure what is that question. So I don't get any question like that. So what was the question about type 2 respiratory failure? Yeah, there was a question on hepatitis B as well. There are two questions, I guess. So one question with regards to uh, HBV serology. And second question was with regards to the prophylaxis, the PEP, post-exposure prophylaxis. Peripheral neuropathy with TB drugs was also a question, okay? ADT question had increased dose of dolutegravir. No, I'm not sure about that. So you have to tell whether it's a single question or a different question. So pre-exposure of hepatitis B. No, no, there is nothing called pre-exposure of hepatitis B, which means... All of, I mean, the only thing that we can do is uh, as a pre-exposure prophylaxis vaccination, nothing more than that. There's no drug that can be given. Serology of ABC, I don't know. So there's a question on this HPV serology, I believe. So I don't know what that question is. All right. Yeah, management of type 2 respiratory failure in COPD. I think this was a question. Are, are you talking about a question of acute exacerbation of COPD? I'm talking about this question. And they've asked about the PrEP of HIV. If it's PrEP of HIV, currently we use double therapy, dual therapy with dolutegravir. Dual treatment with dolutegravir plus tenofovir. Is that the question? There was a PrEP. So pre-exposure prophylaxis for HIV. So yes, we can. So it's actually a double therapy with dolutegravir and tenofovir. So this type 2 respiratory failure question was basically on acute exacerbation of COPD. Healthcare worker, non-responder after a complete six doses. Okay, so good one, good one. There was another HBV question. HBV. Healthcare worker, non-responder. In this case, you have to give two doses of H hepatitis B immunoglobulin. Okay, so that will be the right answer. Two doses of hepatitis B immunoglobulin. Do you get it? I think this was the same question that we discussed the GT, right? In fact, the exact same question, if I'm not wrong. Non-responder, non-responder non twice. This was the exact, exact same question. I don't know. Okay. So pre-exposure prophylaxis, six vaccines already taken. Okay, that is that is uh, twice, like two times into three vaccines. Why is the not responder? You have given two times into three vaccines. You have to give two doses of hepatitis B. Do you remember that in the 30th uh, GT that you had discussed the exact same question? The GT that people said it was very tough. Serodin only, serodin plus tenofovir plus lamiodin. Then it must be tenofovir plus lamiodin. So currently we use dual therapy, which is kind of safe. TLD is not te technically for pre-exposure prophylaxis. Two drugs is enough. So I don't think vaccine is required if already they have completed two courses of hepatitis B vaccine. Just a two dose of hepatitis B immunoglobulin is enough. Okay, all right. So remaining questions, I think we can discuss later on. Not right now. I think there are so many questions that had a lot of disputed options. Unless until you give me the right options, it's very, very difficult. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you.